Savana Pilisandara Savana Pilisandara Mihevani Acharya Sarat Chandra Sekara Adrani Asanani Adat Obata Pilisandara Vatasatana Aragini Mama Sarat Chandra Sekara Hammer Pilisander Vatsatana Kovagia, Pivisha Sangia Kiripat Kerno Adat Ebandu Visha Sangia Kragan at my mouth with any Visha Sangi Tamaya be Palin without a ping this Basha wing, Pilisander Vatsatana, Pout Thunder, Apathy Nakal Latino. So, welcome to our beloved listeners. Uh, this is our ninth Pilisander discussion today. Every time we have uh, brought you something very special to you. This time, uh, it will be conducted in English language with an eminent scientist uh, in Sri Lanka. It's none other than uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Sam Karunaratna, who has created history in Sri Lanka in electrical engineering and computer science and in a variety of other fields. So, uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and welcome Professor Karunaratna to our studio in Toronto. Thank He's you. joining us from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Good evening, uh, Professor Karnaratna. Good evening, you. Well, uh, we are delighted to have you uh, with us today. Some of us know about your career accomplishments in the past. And uh, we are going to uh, invite you to talk and elaborate on certain aspects of that uh, during this uh, conversation. And I would like to call this uh, Pilisandra a delightful conversation. So let me ask a very simple question to begin with. What do you do these days at home or how do you spend your valuable time? Sarah, this, uh, every, as everyone knows, this, we are all homebound because of this coronavirus. But thanks to technology, we are able to carry on some work from home via internet or online. Presently, I'm involved with the management of the University of Colombo. I'm a member of the Council of the University of Colombo. I also am uh, the Board of Management of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, then the University of Colombo School of Computing, then the Agrotech Institute of the University of Colombo, the Cyber Campus, and a few other institutes of the university. I also function as a council member of the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, where we, I was the founder chairman for more than 15 years. There. Now I am only in the council. I don't actively participate other than that. And also, we have meetings of the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka, where I'm a, a member or fellow, and uh, also the National Academy of Sciences. We have monthly meetings, all on Zoom. So, uh, what I'm hearing from you is that although you are officially retired from one job, but you have several other jobs, uh, you know, uh, uh, within your purview. So, anyway, that's uh, great to hear that. So uh, now to become an uh, electrical engineer first and then going up the ladder, the academic ladder in Sri Lanka very fast, what kind of inspiration or influence did you receive from your parents or family where, while growing up? Well, I must pay a tribute to my father first. He, instead of acquiring lands with his money, like his friends, he started spending his money by sending us to uh, a school, St. Mary's College, Kegol, an English school, with very high fees. So, instead of buying land, he made an investment on us, I think, and I'm so grateful to him for doing that. Uh, then my older brother, Neil Karnaratna, who was in Colombo, 
introduced me to the Ceylon Technical College in Kalam. Right. And there I met some of the eminent people in engineering. I was uh, 16 years old at that time, but I got friendly with uh, one Mr. Victor Rasaya. He is the head of electrical engineering of the Ceylon Technical College. Then Mr. Selvadare, he was the head of mathematics. Then Dr. Esel de Silva, he was the director of the Ceylon Technical College at that time. Then Professor R. H. Paul, well, professor of electrical of the University of Ceylon, and Professor E. O. E. Pereira, professor of civil engineering and dean of the faculty of engineering. When I say friends, <laughs> it's with quotation marks, you know, I just communicated with them. And that, uh, that association with those uh, eminent people led me to choose engineering as my future profession. Right, right. Okay, so that's great. Uh, any uh, special reason why you went into uh, electrical engineering and when you had other uh, areas of engineering very popular at that time? Well, Sarat, it's, uh, in a way, it's interesting. You know, this is my story. It's more like fate. Mm -hmm. When I came to Colombo to join the Ceylon Technical College, I had a certain issue. And there was no one to help me. I, as I said earlier, I was 16 years old and helpless. Then I looked at a very kind looking person, the Victor Rasaya, and asked for some help. And he was very good and he helped me uh, after talking to the director of Esel de Silva. He helped me to enter the uh, Ceylon Technical College at that time. At that moment, I thought, I said, these electrical engineers are very nice people. Because I spoke to a physicist earlier, a, a professor or lecturer, he was not helpful. <laughs> and since the electrical engineering head was helpful, I thought, okay, I will also try to be an electrical engineer and maybe I can help some, some others when I become an electrical engineer. That, uh, that was uh, one of the things that made me select my field. Further, of course, I met Professor R. H. Paul. He is supposed to be the father of electrical engineering education in this country. And I had the chance of meeting him. And he was my role model, actually. And that association was the reason to consolidate my, uh, my decision to become an electrical engineer and more so to become a professor of electrical engineering if I can someday. Right. So that's what you finally achieved and uh, you were the head of the department for about 25 years at, at the uh, Moratua uh, University, right? It's time for us to uh, go for your first song. Actually, we requested three songs and you had uh, very kindly sent us three songs. The first one is Amma Sandaki. I know it is a very popular song in Sri Lanka. I would like you to make a comment on that. Why Why do you like that song so much? Uh, Sarath, I don't have much uh, knowledge about songs and lyrics and so on. But when I listen to the song, I feel so nostalgic. This is about the mother, the, the most intimate relationship you have, especially when you're young, is with the mother. So yeah. thinking of the mother, I thought, is a very good way to start. And that's one of the reasons I selected this song. Right. All right, uh, listeners, we are now going to listen to that song, Amma Sandaki. Sandal ki mama e lover 
Listeners, uh, you are now listening to Pilisander, which comes to you with the compliments of Savannah Radio Station in Toronto. And uh, we are right now uh, talking to an eminent scientist in Sri Lanka, Professor Emeritus Sam Karnarath. He's our special guest today. All right, uh, Professor Karnarath, now I would like to go back to my li list of questions that uh, I have in mind. So at this juncture, I would like to focus on your major accomplishments as a scientist, you know, as an engineering science, electrical, electrical engineering, and a whole gamut of area that you have covered in the field of computer science. What are your remarkable achievements you consider remarkable? Well, Sarah, uh, actually, I would not like to describe myself as a scientist. I'm an electrical power system engineer with an interest in the application of digital computers in engineering and management. I can speak at length on computer applications I was involved in more than five decades ago, 50 years ago. In the 1965-70 Dudley Senak government, the government was willing to sponsor or give funds to purchase one computer for Sri Lanka. Can you believe it? <laughs> one computer for Sri Lanka and he was willing to give it to any organization that needs it. Yeah. One computer for the whole country. At that time, no organization, no university was interested. However, Dr. A. N. S. Kulasinghe, who was the chairman of the State Engineering Corporation, said that he is in dire need of a computer. Actually, he also did not know what to do with it, but he said he is in dire need of a computer. Then the government allocated some 3 million rupees at that time, mind you, 50, now it's about I guess about 600 million rupees. Right. 
for the uh, state engineering corporation to acquire an electronic digital computer. At that time, I was at the University of California, Berkeley, engaged in some studies after being a lecturer at the engineering faculty of the University of Siwan, Perudenia. Now he, Dr. Kulsing, almost enticed me by offering me a salary more than twice my salary at the university, actually almost near three times, which was a very big amount at that time. And I came back to Sri Lanka in April 1967 to be in charge of the country's first large-scale computer. After due deliberation, we purchased a British computer called the ICL, 1900 series computer, and Dr. Kulasing asked me to use it for some good purpose. That's all. <laughs> you know, he asked me to use it for good purpose. It was a huge challenge for me. Of course, what we did was the Arata, we recruited the staff required for that and we trained two types of staff, that's the staff to operate the computer and also for programming and management. At that time there were no computer graphics, no graphical user interface. And we had to use and no, uh, no interactive computing. The language used was a machine-dependent language and the instructions are serial. We had only one font, the capital letters, A, B, C, D, to Z, numbers and certain uh, other things like plus, minus, star and so on. Right, right. The hardware consists of a CPU, four large tape drives, a high-speed printer which could print about 1,500 lines per minute, and a whole heap of data entry machines called punch card and verifiers, because our input was, at that time, punch cards, IBM yeah. punch right. cards. Mm -hmm. That was our input. Yeah. So, and it occupied a very large space, like two very big rooms, compared with the kind of handheld computers these days. The first two software programs we developed. Now, mind you, this is what we are doing for the first time in Sri Lanka. Yeah. It was a salaries and wages system, and the second one was the inventory control system for the civil engineering construction. The salary system was to pay. Now we had 15,000 employees in our corporation, state engineering corporation. Right. And they were engaged in civil engineering work, construction work, at over 50 different work sites all over the country. The payment was not a fixed payment, like, like the monthly payment. It was a weekly payment, and it the pay depended on the category, the grade, the number of hours worked at a given rate over a week by different employees. It was thoroughly complicated, I must say, due to so many variables. Mind you, this is, I'm talking again, reminding you, this is 50 years ago, when computer technology was almost at its infancy. That's why we think we did something good. The inventory control system was to ensure that all the required material was available at each and every site for construction activity so that there will be no delay in construction. And we were, of course, highly successful uh, and we earned the praise from the chairman now, uh, since this is my pet topic, I would like to go on a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead, yeah. Then, uh, after that, we used the computer to design multi-story buildings. The first building we designed by a computer was a 10-story building for the Ceylon Technical College. 
that was done and then we went for some exotic work like designing a very uh, different kind of building, the Kalutara Chaitya. Now the Kalutara Chaitya is a, is a shell structure. It's not a normal structure, it's a shell structure. And analyzing and designing using shell structure theory is extremely difficult. And uh, just to compare, the 11-story, 10-story building, we took only 16 minutes to design, whereas the Kalutara Chaitya, we took seven hours continuous uh, working to design that uh, structure. Then, for these things, of course, we had the, a language called Fortran, yeah. formula translation, to, to develop the software. At that time, only a few of us knew Fortran and how to use it. So what I did was, I wrote the first book on Fortran programming in right. 1967. Right. And I was so happy, you know, after two or three to four years, thousand copies were sold. Right. So that gave me a kind of feeling, okay, now thousand people know at least how to use this language. See some knowledge of the Fortran language and that's the great thing. Then we did two more projects. One thing is just to show, uh, show the people that this computer is useful, what I what we did was we computerized the GC GCO level result processing. At that time, the manual method they took more than seven months to release the results. After doing the examination, students had to wait more than seven months to get their results. What we said was we'll computerize, and in fact, it was uh, not very well taken by the department, but we insisted, and we were able to release the results of uh, 360,000 candidates within 13 days of receiving the marks, which was a great thing. And then, of course, if there was any opposition to the computer by the people, it was completely negated by this. And I think it's, uh, it was a remarkable achievement at that time. The next thing I want to harp on is the economic ana econometric analysis of the Sri Lanka's economy. Now, there was no way to analyze uh, the economy quantitatively. And there was a team of people from Cambridge University headed by Lal Jawadhan, a former bank governor or somebody, and uh, they were spending a lot of money uh, to do this. So we undertook the econometric analysis, we developed our equations and the software for that, and we, for a very small amount, like 360,000 rupees, uh, we were able to do what they wanted uh, in a fairly short time. And that was, uh, I think, a major achievement. We also did, of course, a lot of studies on electric power systems, such as load flow studies, fault studies, use of the Ceylon electricity board. At that time, earlier, the engineers had to go to another country to come and to uh, do perform these studies. But once we had this computer at the State Engineering Corporation we were able to do all their studies, what they required. That is uh, a little bit of what we did. Right. It's a great uh, historical uh, analysis of, you know, how uh, the computer science and the computers uh, themselves evolved in Sri Lanka. Now, uh, you know, uh, we, we were not really f behind anything because when I was came to Canada in 1989, uh, we only had the DOS system. There were only two computers in the University of Toronto Department of Sociology. Only two computers, machines, <laughs> and we had to book time. 
and uh, then suddenly the windows came and the whole thing changed you know it was a very very pleasant uh, you know interesting uh, story that you were relating to us uh, thank you for that uh, anyway uh, it is time for us to go for your second song I think uh, you have selected uh, Baddha Pura Sudhu Redda Vagi. That's also a very famous song, you know, for at least for 50, 60 years in Sri Lanka. Uh, do you have anything to say about it? You know, Sarat, uh, many people are driven by nostalgia, you know, coming from the village. Yeah. For us, the New Year, uh, April New Year was a big uh, Thing for kids, uh, and we revelled in that kind of uh, situation where we uh, sort of celebrate the New Year, and that's one of the reasons. And another one, of course, was when I was at the University of Ceylon Perudenia, engineering faculty, I went on over to the other side, to the arts faculty, to meet someone. And uh, when I went there, in her room, there was a board, a green or black board, and it was written, <laughs> the song was written on that <laughs> black board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I was, uh, I have two good reasons to have some kind of uh, favor towards that uh, song, you know. Right. All right. So uh, that's your liking for the song, and uh, we are now going to listen to that song, uh, Badda Pura Sudurid Devagi. Get 
Dear listeners, you are listening to Pilisandara program uh, coming to you with the compliments of Savana radio station in Toronto. And we have with us today a uh, special uh, uh, guest uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, Emeritus, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Sam Karunarat. Okay, uh, you were talking about Peradeni a little while ago. Uh, now, uh, I want uh, to take you to your main job at the University of Moratua and you were there as the Vice Chancellor for some time. So what were the initial challenges when you accepted the job? To be a Vice Chancellor of course is a bit of a difficult task. My term of office was from 1996 to 1999. Still the terrorist problem was on and we had to close the university many times due yeah. to the troubles, but we were mostly concerned at that stage improving the quality of the undergraduates and the postgraduate courses, and uh, we had achieved 100% employment for our graduates at that time. More than uh, that, at that time, I was also concurrently the director of the Arthur Clark Center for Modern Technologies while okay. being the vice chancellor. Right. And I had to develop both institutions at the same time. So it was a bit of a rather hectic work at that time. I did not know how I managed it, you know. Now, uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, when you are the vice chancellor of any university in Sri Lanka, you need to get a lot of cooperation from your colleagues, the fellow team members, the faculty and students. So what kind of cooperation do uh, you think you received uh, from them? You know, with the academic staff <coughs> and also the non-academic staff, especially the senior staff, they had unstinted support yep. to the vice chancellor. No problem, never a kind of hard were no ill feeling. But as you know, students, they have their own problems based on mostly petty things. University of Moratua had uh, you know, programs at two different levels. One is the degree level and one at the diploma level. And often these two groups of uh, students clashed with each other on very simple parochial issues. There were protests and strikes, which were of course common to all universities in Sri Lanka at that time. But I must say that the, in comparison, the University of Moroto fared much better than all other universities, despite the fact that we had a few strikes and um, things like that. That's right. I think that was something common to uh, uh, major universities in Sri Lanka at that time. Uh, Peradeni had a lot of strikes and uh, at one time I remember the army was called into the campus <laughs> and there was a big fight. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Kalaniya, the university, Javadanapura. I think, you know, we in a way, when we look at them now, you know, we have wasted a lot of time. You know, we should have been spent on more productive work. Because most of the people who are leading those uh, strikes and protests, you know, they are doing very well in, in other countries and in, in big jobs <laughs> in Sri Lanka. So they have simply mis misled a majority of students. Anyway, uh, let's go to a, a different area that uh, I was uh, going through your, your bio data. Uh, I think uh, I would like our listeners to learn about that too. You have been a, you have been a writer 
apart from you know managing all these electrical wire, wiring systems in the country and you have been a writer uh, and you have authored some books in singhal i heard so could you uh, elaborate on that well that this <laughs> this is a laugh you know <laughs> i am no writer of fiction you see i only write some papers and books related to electrical engineering but having got married to <laughs> professor kusuma kaurarathne or kusuma jayasuri i started reading literature and fiction books from a library at home right and i thought of writing my autobiography in sinhalese mm -hmm. and i wrote it it was named mata tama mata kai i still remember remember yeah right? and this ex this is not a right i said is an experiment in singhala writing yeah. my for me at the end many of our students and friends who read that thought that it was uh, an entertaining book as it uh, describes my unprecedented gains and similar losses in my life okay <laughs> unprecedented gains and unprecedented losses in my life right. reading that book brings me nostalgic memories and also scary risks that i have taken in my life i am scared now actually for what i have done uh, those days <laughs> all in all i must say that i have been somewhat lucky in life so far I have a principle in life. I have tell, I told the students, knowingly, I will never harm anyone. Knowingly, I will never harm anyone. Unknowingly, I do not know. Recently, with this house arrest situation due to COVID, I tried more experiments in writing in Sinhala, and I have written some things, and I hope to publish uh, them. Uh, once this uh, trouble is over, my I written a short story book again based on my life experience, and I tried a translation of short stories by my uh, famous uh, Italian author, whom I like, Alberto Moravia, and I hope to publish this thing once this COVID situation eases. You know. All right. So, so you are you're, describing me an, as an author and so on. My God, <laughs> it's very well. No, the reason why I uh, wanted to bring that up, you know, uh, we we know a couple of people. Uh, for instance, Doctor uh, Nandadasa Kolagota. He was a medical scientist, as a practitioner, doctor, but he was also a musician. He had other talents, you know, which contributed to his. Uh, you know popularity and also skills and gurudas amarsekar was a dentist but he started writing all the novels and short stories i'm sure your beloved no, wife no, you know. don't compare me <laughs> with those <laughs> stories you know no but one, um, one one advantage you have is you have an editor at home so whatever you write there is a person who can look in into fact, that 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 gave me the courage you know uh, so uh, I will go to the next question. That is, uh, some people in in the Western world point out that Sri Lankan universities are not as productive as before. They compare the last uh, 20, 30 years, and our ranking has gone down. You know, I think Katuvad, uh, the the uh, Morotu University was at one time, you know, of the best of, of all the Sri Lankan universities. So they refer to insufficient research capacities, faculty qualifications, and students are just not takers and not learners what is your assessment at least in your own area well it's a very controversial kind of subject of course there may be some justification for this feeling but this must be viewed in its proper perspective sir yeah. the university community in sri lanka is rather small both staff and students now Just consider now, Arizona State University in the U.S. has over one hundred thousand undergraduate students. Right. And we have in the whole country, I think, less than that. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. all universities. 
the entire Sri Lanka undergraduate population must be in that kind of range. And also the similarly academic staff members, the numbers are very low here. And research done in Sri Lanka in the field of uh, in the fields other than engineering, science, architecture, and medicine, etc., are done and published in single. Yeah. And therefore, and they are published in single publications, and that these things do not reach the international community. Right. That's right. Then the funds available for research in Sri Lanka is minuscule, you know, very small, very right. low. These contribute towards a low output in research, maybe. But in engineering, I must say, the situation is not that bad. Further, the universities insist now on research and publications or promotions to the next grade. As such, there is a trend towards more research publications at the present times. With reference to ranking, I must say, you know, you must go to the basis of this ranking. Yeah. Why we have a low ranking? <laughs> That's one, the criteria, you know, sometimes is foreign students, how many foreign students you have in right. the country, and yeah. that adds up to the marks. Yeah. Then, about uh, things like how do you, uh, how do you treat women in the country? <laughs> You know, things like that are embodied in that criterion for ranking, yeah. which is the number, it gives some idea, I think we have to accept that, but uh, we are not very happy about the ranking. Now, since I'm now working for the, uh, at least in the Colombo University as a council member, our ranking has really gone up. <laughs> Yeah. Columbia University ranking, it had gone, it was a thousand or something, now it's what, 800, I think. It's number right. one in Sri Lanka university right. system. Right. I, a lot of papers are published actually now in the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. I think uh, the ranking will uh, probably will go up and also now the, uh, the, the management is looking at these uh, factors for ranking and they are trying to match some of them. So there's a likelihood that the ranking might go up in the near future. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a very important uh, explanation that you are giving. The, the criteria used in ranking is one of the questions, you know, and also a lot of people write in single and then they are not reaching the, uh, the international audience. And uh, also the, uh, the size of the country and the university education anyway, I think I remember in 1966, uh, University of Peradeniya was the 66th best university in the world. I mean, if you compare from 1966 to 2021, you can see a very big difference. But we hope that, you know, the university authorities will continue to support with new funds, especially the government of Sri Lanka, I think must, uh, you know, allocate a lot of funding. Uh, for different in, 19, in 1966, Sarah, most of the work was done in English, yeah. even the right. arts and social sciences. Right. Then right. later they changed the medium of instruction, then that's yeah. one of the reasons why we are reflecting badly in the international arena. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, anyway, that is something for the, the current uh, faculty uh, to think about. And uh, before we go to the, the, your third song, I want to uh, again divert your attention to something else. You mentioned about this a little while ago, you went to a, a residence hall and then you saw something written on the, on the blackboard. I'm sure this is connected with that. Uh, Savana Pilsandara had a, a very beautiful interview uh, with your beloved wife, uh, Professor Kusuma Karnarat, a couple of uh, months ago, a few months ago. So if you have no reservations, I would like to hear about your love story. <laughs> Sarat, this is very uh, embarrassing and also <laughs> hilarious, you know. At my age now, when I think of what I have done when I was young, I can laugh at myself, you know. Okay. But I suppose this is not uh, unusual. 
some well-known fiction writers, some of them you have mentioned, in their later life have decried their own writings that they have done in their early life, early years, right. especially right. when it refers to love and intimate love stories, you know. So my feeling is not different from some of them. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, in engineering, we have units to measure all types of quantities. We yeah. measure current in amperes, power in watts, frequency in hertz, and so on. But to measure beauty of a girl, we have no unit of beauty. <laughs> Yeah. Right? So when I was a student, I uh, coined in my mind, of course, a measure to, uh, to measure the beauty of a girl. And I came with uh, a unit called Helen. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, Helen of Troy was supposed to have been extremely beautiful. So one Helen, of course, it will be 1,000 milli Helens. Right. Okay. Right, so like milliampers and yeah, amperes. Yeah, right, so. right. Now I was looking for a girl at that time whose beauty in my mind to be greater than 500 millihelens. <laughs> that is greater right. than average, you know. Right. Half as beautiful as the Helen of Troy. Then I had certain um, specifications for the partner whom I'm looking for, <coughs> I thought that such a person must have the width of the mouth to be 60% more than the width of the nose. Okay. Then the height from hip to, from, from feet to hip must be 60% more than the height from hip to the crown. Then the height Total height must be at least 1.6 meters and so on. So I had those specifications done, but leave alone those specifications, there was not a single girl in the faculty of engineering. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, but our fortunes changed when the engineering faculty shifted to Peradeniya in 1964. Yeah. Now there, over the other side of the Maha Valley River, from the engineering faculty, there were plenty of girls in the arts faculty, medical faculty, and so on. One day, a colleague of mine, a lecturer in the arts faculty, asked me for a lift in my car to go to Ramanathan Hall to meet a lady lecturer to hand over some official work. Yep as he was proceeding to Cambridge for his higher studies. That was the day I saw Miss Kusuma Jayasurya dressed in an elegant sari and having her characteristic swaying walk. Sarah, have you heard of a song that I can just read the lyrics? It said, she walks like an angel walks. She talks like an angel talks. Her hair has that sort of curl. And to my mind, she's my kind of girl. Have you listened to that song? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, leave, leaving the three lines, the fourth line, I felt at that time that she is my kind of girl, you know, other things I can't say. <laughs> right. You know? But uh, that, was, uh, that was my first uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, to Zoom. And uh, I made a little friendship and then the, the students in the arts faculty, they go to World's End annually for a trip. And uh, I had the chance of uh, accompanying them, and uh, <coughs> there we were able to consolidate our friendship a little bit more. And then, subsequent to that, uh, 
she came and asked me, she called me and asked a very plain question. She said, I don't think girls do that. She asked me, are you serious about me? She asked me. I gave her a plain answer. I said, I have seriousness in view. I did not commit myself. I said seriousness in view. And then, however, I had to leave her and go to the United States. And when I came back in 1967, we were married and that was it. Right. But after a few weeks of marriage, she left to England and I was left alone. Yep. That's the story. That's the story. <laughs> That's right. I think what is fascinating is about your formula, you know, the how to how to measure, how to find a, a partner using that. <laughs> Maybe that is something for the, the for the current uh, the present generation in Sri Lanka. I know they are using different kinds of criteria. But anyway, so uh, that finally she is with you now, uh, so that's great. Uh, uh, now, uh, let me uh, ask you another question about, you have two uh, uh, brilliant sons, you know, they are, I, I heard they are not living in Sri Lanka. Uh, can you comment on them? What do they do, you know, and are they following your footsteps? Sarah, mm, this is a bit... Uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's a sad story or a good story. In the early 90s, the security situation in this country was rather bad and not to our taste, you know. And after much deliberation, we decided to send our two children for university studies, uh, and even though this was a kind of painful decision. They were at that time 20 years, and the other younger one was 16 years old. Now, both of them completed their uh, studies and also their doctoral studies in electrical and computer engineering, both of them. I never asked them to do it, but naturally they selected that. And at the end of studies, they found a lucrative employment in Australia and in the US, respectively. And now we have two granddaughters one grandson, we miss their company, and with the COVID, even their visits have become so infrequent. Earlier they used to visit us frequently. We can only thank the internet. We have only the privilege of seeing them and talking to them online. That's all, no physical contact. We are quite happy with our two kids, you know, they have done uh, fairly well in life, I think. Right, so that's uh, that's the academic story of the family. Uh, I think we will go for your last song now, uh, which is uh, sung by Purnima Vikramasinghe, the sister of uh, famous uh, musician Jagat Vikramasinghe. And I heard that this song was written by your beloved wife, uh, Professor Karna Ratna. Uh, can you uh, say... Uh, Something about that song? Yeah, she has written uh, several songs uh, based on uh, family members. And this song is uh, about my little son, who is now in the US. Uh, she used to take him to school, to Royal College, every morning. And one day when uh, they, they used to hold hands and go, and one day my wife was about to slip and fall, and he held her uh, hand tight and didn't allow her to fall. And I think this instance is the one that she has uh, put into the song, you know. So, right. The title of the song is also Akuru Karan Neta Katu Giyami Mama. I think, uh, listeners, we will listen to that song now. Thank you. 
Beloved listeners, uh, you, you are now listening to the Pilisandra, the ninth uh, edition. Uh, I would like to call this the uh, delightful conversation. Uh, with us today is uh, Emeritus Professor Sam Karnarath. Uh, we are going through uh, his uh, life story and his accomplishments. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure it's a, it's a known fact that, uh, you know, the thousands of your students are uh, in the Western world, they are living here, they are uh, working and they are doing extremely well. I know a couple of them uh, in, uh, in in Canada as well. Uh, so I have, I had the privilege of talking to some of them and what I heard from them is that as a teacher, you have been very strict with them and you have been very tough with them. At that time, they did not apparently like uh, uh, that kind of a treatment, but today, they are telling me that, you know, because of that strictness and toughness that they have become who they are today because they, they realize the value of that as, 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 a, as a learner in electrical engineering. And uh, so, uh, they of course, they all love you very much. That's what they say. So, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, for us, strict professional discipline is required in any profession, I believe. And in electrical engineering, this statement is even more true. Electrical engineers, as you know, sometimes work with extremely high voltages, for example, 220,000 volts or 500,000 volts. Even the household voltage that we use, 230 volts in Sri Lanka, is pretty dangerous 
unless a person is careful, uh, eat it. Do you know that, Parad, that a, a current, a very low current like 50 milliamperes can kill a human being if it passes through the human body? That is only one twentieth of an ampere, which is rather small. As such, there are many types of safety features uh, we employ in the electricity industry. I, in every home, I know that there is a, a trip switch or a circuit breaker that if the leakage current is about 30 milliamperes, the, it trips these two just to save the person. You know, when I was a student, I was in the workshop where we had our training, and there was a picture of a monkey, a poster with a picture of a monkey trying to poke two wires into a wall socket. Below that was a statement, do not monkey, call the electrician. So this is what I said, you can't monkey with electricity and that's one of the reasons maybe I'm strict. But being strict professionally and being strict socially are two different things. I'm extremely friendly with students socially. I like my students actually. I think my students are my wealth. I have strived hard to find better opportunities for my students, both uh, locally and abroad. In fact, I have told the students that if they do not have a job, they could come to me and it's my business to find them a job. I, during my tenure as the Dean of Engineering and Architecture of four years, I was able to send nearly 80 academics for higher studies and also for seminars and so on. As you have said earlier, despite my professional strictness, I know most of my students like me. As proof of it, on my completion of 25 years as Professor of Electrical Engineering, my students presented me with a plaque where the caption was, Malin Gandhin Pudamu Kese. With what flowers and fragrance do we adore you? They appreciated my service as a teacher, which I valued very much. My former students, some are professors, like Professor Anna Kage at, uh, uh, in Canada, Manitoba University, Professor Indurua in the UK, Professor B.S.P. Pereira in Australia, and also I have a well-known student who is uh, Sanat Daya Prema. He is a paratrooper instructor in the U.S. Army. He keeps in touch with me and he tells me all kinds of stories about the U.S. Army. So that was the, the feeling that I have towards students and also the feeling that the students have, I suppose, uh, towards me. The, their success stories, the success stories of my students, that brings a lot, lot of immense joy to me just because uh, they were my former students. That's right. Yeah, that is a, that's a kind of a great, great uh, ending to that kind of a story. Uh, there's one thing I uh, wanted to ask you about. Uh, we did not touch on that. Uh, that is your connection with uh, establishing the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. Are you still uh, involved with them? Yes. You know, when um, in my la last stages of my being vice chancellor, what uh, we realized is the number of uh, IT specialists that we are producing in the university, they are inadequate. There were hundreds. We decided that it has to be thousands. It has to be a, a quantum jump to satisfy the needs of the industry. 
But the university system is such that you can't do that kind of thing in the university because the university is a highly inertial system. It opposes big changes, you know. It allows only very small <laughs> uh, changes. So we had no alternative, but uh, what we did was we thought of another institute apart from the university. And with some, uh, a few of my colleagues and, uh, and also with some support from the government, we started an institute called the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology in 1999, that's the last year of my uh, tenure as VC. We started with 200 students and today it's over 10,000 students in that institute. It's a huge organization, very successful organization. We have um, graduated more than 20,000 IT specialists for the last 20 years. And uh, I was the founder chairman of that for 15 years. Then I was an advisor for three years. And after retirement, of course, my function, I function as a member of the council. Still, I keep contact with the institute. It's our institute, you know. Right, right. Now, that's, uh, that's a great news because uh, I read that uh, <clears throat> Over 80% of the youngsters in Sri Lanka, between, let's say, 15 to 29 or 30, uh, they are computer literate. You know, they are using computers for various purposes uh, in addition to their education. Now, they should be uh, very proud to listen to uh, this uh, conversation, the delightful conversation, because this is how things started in, in Sri Lanka. And uh, I think, you know, we are ever thankful to you for uh, for... Uh, you know, bringing all these new uh, dimensions to uh, the, the scientific uh, development in Sri Lanka. Now, I'm going to go to the last question. Now, this is uh, seeking some advice from you. Supposing a new university faculty member who is in the between 25 and 30 comes to you and asks for an advice how he or she should plan his or her future career. What is your advice for them? Sir, the members who are taken to the faculty as academics are naturally high performers. They generally have first classes. In later years, they are expected to train and guide students and even younger staff members. For this purpose, the research degree and involvement in research is a must. The university is very liberal in providing leave opportunities these days for further study and research for young academics. Therefore, young faculty members must take this opportunity to, to improve, improve themselves and thereby improve the status of the university as well. One must work diligently with a sense of love towards the institution. I have coined a slogan which goes as follows our university, our life. That means our university, our life, that we have no life without the university. So that's the feeling you, I try to uh, imbibe in the hearts of the young academics who join the university. This trade union action strikes uh, should not be our forte. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh uh, Karna Ratna. So uh, we spend uh, almost a uh, little over one hour and going through your your life journey, you know, and uh, that's why we call it a delightful conversation with you. And uh, so uh, on behalf of uh, Savana Radio in Toronto, and especially it's uh, uh, the producer, the Vasant uh, Lanka Tilaka, and Pilisandra, uh, let me extend our very sincere gratitude for you, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, allowing us to uh, sort of screen through your, the life story and uh, spending uh, over one hour. And uh, so uh, uh, we hope to uh, uh, see you again uh, some someday. And uh, maybe whenever you do something very new, uh, please let us know. <laughs> we'll come back to you and then we'll uh, inquire about it. 
So uh, thank you very much, and also to uh, both of you. Thank you, you and I time. take this opportunity to thank you and Vasanta for giving me this opportunity. In fact, uh, I was uh, diffident uh, to face uh, Mike, but I think uh, I have been able to provide you with the kind of information you expected from me. And it, uh, it's my privilege to have been uh, with you uh, for this program. Again, Dr. Sarvat Chandrasekhar and Vasanta, thank you very much for having me on this program. Yeah, that's uh, the purpose of this Pelisandra to bring forward, you know, and then uh, uh, sort of review the, the past history and the current developments of certain people. We are not going into everybody that we know, but people who have created history, especially in Sri Lanka, uh, they are sometimes in Sri Lanka like you, and sometimes they are here or when they visit us. So we will, uh, we are haste to uh, catch them and get them to talk to us about this. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Thank you. Pidi Sandra, Samana, Antarjala Guanigili, Idripat Kirima.